So we have seen the concept of memoization and dynamic programming in the context of Fibonacci, which is a kind of uh, very artificial example. So let us look at a more interesting example. So this problem is called grid paths. Right? So supposing we have these roads which are arranged in a rectangular grid. So this is often called a Manhattan grid because the city of Manhattan has roads like this. And let us assume that these roads are one way, right. So the roads are one way. So you can either go right or you can go up, right. You cannot go left, you cannot go down. Now we start at the beginning and we want to reach something at the top right. This is our target, right. The question is if I start at 0, 0 which is the left bottom corner and I have you know, I have to travel 1, 2, 3 up to m sideways and up to n upwards, right. So I will reach in general a corner which is labeled m comma n. So the question is how many different ways are there of going, right. I could go this way, I could go this way. So each time if I follow a different segment of road, it is a different path. So the question is how many such paths are there. So these are called grid paths because this is a grid of roads, right. And it is a very standard problem in combinatorics. So for example, this blue line is one such path. It only goes up or right and it takes us from 0, 0. In this concrete case where m is 5 and n is 10, it takes us from 0, 0 to 5 comma 10. Here is another path, the red path. It goes further to the right before it starts going up, but it also never moves left or down, right. It always goes right and up. And here is the third yellow path. So there are obviously many different paths. So the question is how many such paths are there? This is what we want to count, right. So our goal is to count how many such paths are there. So there is a very standard and very elegant way of analyzing this mathematically. So what you see is that it does not matter how I do it, right. I have to move 15 times to go from where I move means go from one corner to the next corner, right. I have to follow 15 steps to go from 0, 0 to 5, 10 because I have to go 5 times to the right and 10 times up, right. I have to go up this entire segment and I have to go right this entire thing. The only way I can go right is to take one segment from this road to the this corner to the next corner. So I have to do that 5 times and I have to do 10 times going up. But notice that no matter how I do it because I never go down and I never go left, I keep making progress, right. So if I go 3 times right and then 4 times up, those 3 times have been done. So I only need to do 2 more to the right, I only need to do 6 more up. So no matter which way I reorganize the path, if you count the number of rights and ups in the blue path, the yellow path, the red path, they are all the same, right. So there are always 15 moves and in these 15 moves, there are always 5 right moves and 10 up moves. So if I tell you where all I took the right turn, so if I said that I made the right turn at 1, 2, 3, 5 and 8, right, then it means at positions 4, 6, so this is 9, 7, 8, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, at all these other numbers, I must have gone up, right. So I have these 15 slots. In these 15 slots, I can either go right or I can go up and there are only 5 where I can go right. So I pick those 5, the remaining 10 slots must be up, right. So how many ways can I pick those 5 positions where I turn right? That is the question. Each time I make a right turn, right, that defines a path because the remaining ups are, are fixed. So if I know where I turned right, that determines a path. The number of different ways of turning right tell me the total number. So this is just this notation of choosing out of the 15 possible positions which I have, choosing 5 of them to turn right, right. So this is a famous factorial uh, uh, example. So ncr is n factorial divided by r factorial times n minus r factorial, right. So this is the formula. So it turns out you can explicitly evaluate it for this number 5 comma 10 and you will get 3003. Now notice that I have said that we fix the rights, we could also fix the ups, right. So there are 15 positions, it is symmetric, right. If I tell you where all I went up, then you know in the remaining 5 positions I went right. So either I can fix the 5 rights or the 10 ups and in fact this is a general thing in, in, uh, in, in this uh, combinations and permutations, you know that n choose r is the same as n choose n minus r, right. So if you are choosing 3 things out of 7, it is the same as choosing 4 things out of 7 because every time I choose 4 things, I have implicitly chosen 3 things. Every time I choose 3 things, I have implicitly chosen the other 4. So the 2 are symmetric, right. So I can also think of this as 15 choose 10, right, by fixing the 10 up moves. So this is a neat combinatorial solution to this problem. So why are we interested in this? Well, 
what if the world is not as easy as it is, right? So we all know in every city that we live that there is always a problem at some place or the other and the road is being dug up, right? It could be dug up because there is a problem with the sewerage line or somebody is laying some cables or just that the road has been damaged by rain. So let us assume that there is this one intersection, right, which is currently dug up. We are not allowed to go through this intersection, right? So this intersection concretely is at 2, 4, right? So now the question is, if I am not allowed to go through 2, 4, now how many ways are there of going through this? So let us see what happens. Well, we have this blue path, right? This blue path unfortunately was going through 2, 4. So this is not a path that we could take anymore. This red path avoids 2, 4. So this is fine. But the yellow path also went through 2, 4. So the yellow path must also be skipped, right? So what we have to do is we have to make sure that when we are counting, we do not count paths that pass through 2, 4. Right? So we have to discard every path that passes through 2, 4. So we can apply a similar combinatorial reasoning for this. We can say, how do you get a path that goes through 2, 4? Well, it must go from here to 2, 4 and then it must go from here to there. right? So I want to count the number of, I know the total number of paths, 3003. I want to count the number of paths which I want to throw out, saying that they pass through 2, 4. Well, how do I do that? Well, I count the number of paths which go from 0 to 2, 4 and then from 2, 4 to my destination because I know that every path that I am interested in will be a combination of a path of the first type and a path of the second type. right? So if I go from 0 to here, I am basically solving the old grid path problem for this smaller grid. right? So this smaller grid has got 2 rights and 4 ups. right? So for this, I have 2 plus 4, 6 possible moves of which I have to choose 2 and I get 15 paths. So there are 15 ways of going from here to 2, 4 and this smaller grid has 3 rights and 6 ups because I have already finished the rest, right? It is a smaller grid. So here I have 9 choose 3, right? 3 rights, 6 ups, 9 choose 3 and if you calculate it, it turns out to be 84. So now any path which passes through 2, 4 is this, one of these plus one of these, right? But any combination is possible. So to get the total number, I should multiply. I should say for every one of those 15 paths, there are 84 matching paths on the other side and each one of these combinations is a different path. So I have totally 15 times 84, 1260 paths, which actually pass through this forbidden intersection. Now totally I had 3003 paths. So if I subtract 1260, I get that there are 1743 paths left. So, so far so good. So our counting strategy using this combinations has worked for the path, uh, the perfect situation where the grids do not have any holes and it is worked for this one blocked intersection case. So, of course, the natural question is what happens if there are two blocked intersections, right? So, now I have a block at 2, 4 and at 4, 4. Now, what happens? So, the earlier red path which was not passing through 2, 4 now gets discarded because it is passing through 4, 4. So, obviously, more paths will get discarded because now I have two possible reasons why I should discard them. Either they pass through 2, 4 or they pass through 4, 4. But what about that yellow path? So that yellow path passed through both 2, 4 and 4, 4. That means if I discard it, if I count the number of paths which pass through 2, 4, throw them out, and then I separately count the number of paths which pass through 4, 4 and throw them out, this yellow path has been counted twice. So I have thrown it out twice. Okay. So then you have to go back and you have to add back all the paths which actually pass through both the things. Again, you can do that, right? You can do that by again saying how many ways are there to go from 0 to 2, 4, 2, 4. To, so how many paths pass through both of these? You can count it exactly as we did before. You have to multiply now three numbers. How many ways are going from here to there? How many ways from here to there? How many ways from here to there and multiply them, right? And then you have to add this number back. So this is a general counting principle called inclusion and exclusion. In some of these Venn diagram problems also, you have the same thing in a different guise. So you will say that, you know, there are so many people study physics, so many people study chemistry, so many people study biology, and then so many people study two of the subjects. Now, if you count the people who study two of the subjects, implicitly it also counts people who study all three. So if you add this up, it will have an over counting. So then you have to subtract the people who study all three. So you have to include, exclude at every level. Right? So this can be done, but it becomes really tedious. If I have now, if I put five holes, then you're going to have a really tough time evaluating this using this kind of arithmetic approach. So what can we do instead? Right? 
So can we apply some kind of inductive structure to this problem and solve it? So let us look at the problem. The problem in general is to know if I am at trying to reach, so remember even for, for solving the whole problem, I needed to know how many ways I can reach 2 by 4, uh, 2 comma 4, right. So in general I have a target i comma j which may not be the ultimate target, may not be m comma n, the top right target, but I want to know how many ways can I get from 0, 0 to i comma j, right. So the inductive structure comes from the fact that we have constrained our moves to be right and left. So how can I reach i comma j? Well, I could move up from the previous row, right. So I can be in the same, uh, I can be at in, in the sorry in the previous yeah in the same row I can be in the previous column I can go from so this should be move right I guess right and I can also move up from the previous row right so again just we'll I will fix this but so this is the previous column and this is the previous row but the point is there are exactly two neighboring corners from where I could have reached here in the last step, right. I could either come up from one row below or I would have come right from one column on the left. So how many ways are there of reaching this? Well, I must either come here and then extend it by one path or I must come here and extend it by one path, right. So if I know how many ways there are of reaching this place and I know how many ways there are of reaching this place, then I know how many ways there are of reaching i comma j because every path which reaches my left neighbor by adding exactly that one edge, there is no choice anymore. I have to take that one edge to reach i comma j. Similarly, every no path that reaches the neighbor below, I can add one edge. So in this way, you can say that every path to these neighbors extends to a unique path. And so the recurrence tells us that the number of paths p i j reaching i j is just the sum p i minus 1 j plus the p i j minus 1, right? The number of paths reaching my left neighbor and the below neighbor. If I just add it up, I get the, the answer. So we have to always when we have an inductive definition, we have to realize that this keeps going down. So at some point we have to tell it to stop, right. So we have to tell it to stop. So in particular, if we are just counting the number of paths from the starting point to the starting point, right, there is, I do not move at all, but it is not saying that there is no path. Not moving at all is the same as saying there is only one way to stay there. So P00. The number of paths from 0, 0 to 0, 0 without doing anything is 1, right. So this is important, otherwise you will not get started in counting anything. Now if I look at some boundary conditions, right, so if I look at this bottom row, then I cannot come from below. If I look at the left column, I cannot come from the left, right. So if I am in the bottom row, right, then my call, my y coordinate is 0, right. So if the y coordinate is 0, then I can only come from the left. So it is the same as the number of things reaching the left. And similarly, if the x coordinate is 0, right, then I am in the left column. I cannot come from uh, the left, so I can only come from below, right. So maybe this is actually, yeah, so this is actually correct if I do not think about it rows and columns as x and y coordinate, right. So this is saying that at the, at the previous x coordinate and this is the previous y coordinate. So that will resolve that, okay. So anyway, so that is our uh, recursion now, right. So recursion says that p of ij is p of i minus 1j plus p of ij minus 1 and in particular p of 0, 0 is 1 and if I am in the base case where I, in the, in the border case where both of these are not defined, then the one that is not defined I will just treat it as 0. There are no paths coming from that side. Now the question is why does this help? Well, the reason this helps is that what do I do at a hole? Well, for a hole I say that no matter what I can do to come, so if I have a hole here, right, it also has two neighbors below and, but the problem with the hole is I cannot reach it, right. So regardless of the fact that this might be some k and this might be some l, there may be some k ways to reach to the left of the hole and some l ways to reach below the hole. This is not k plus l, but this is just the number 0, right. So this is just 0. It is not k plus, normally it will be k plus l. The number of ways to reach that thing will be how many ways I can come to the left, how many ways I can come below, but it is not. It is just k plus l is 0, okay. So, so this is the clever thing now. So we can now, wherever we see a hole in our grid, we can predefine the number of paths reaching that point to be 0 and then we can apply this induction and it will work, right. So let us look at this more carefully, right. So first let us look at this problem that we had before of memoization and dynamic programming. So if we use this in a trivial way, then of course we will be computing the same problem again and again, right. So for instance, look at P510. 
So P510 requires us to compute the values at P410 and P59, right? But now both of these in turn, right? So this will require us to compute these two and this will require us to compute these two. So both of them will require this value at P49. So if I do a naive recursion, P49 will be evaluated twice. So I don't want to do that. So therefore I will use either memoization or I will use dynamic programming, which is just saying that I will find a suitable order in which to compute Pij so that whenever I come to a, a, an intersection i comma j, the values that it depends on have already been computed. Right? And to find the suitable order, right, we need to identify this DAG structure, we said, what is the dependency? So it's very clear, right? The dependency just says, so these are all these arrows which are coming together. So it's saying that each problem at a given ij depends on the problem to its left and the problem below, right? So that's the DAG structure. So now with this DAG structure, we realize that this is the only node which does not have any incoming edges. So any kind of pre-computation that dynamic programming does, is going to start from here. Remember dynamic programming will take this DAG of values and it will ev evaluate them in topological order so that whenever you come to a node whose value needs to be computed, the values that you need in that inductive definition are already computed because they are lower in the DAG. So we start at this value. So we remember that P of 0, 0 is 1, right? So we start with 1. And now for instance, we could do this row by row, right? So remember that on the row, we said that because there's nothing coming from below, the value at any node is just the number of things coming from the left. So since I started with one, it's very clear. If I'm going this way, there's only one way to go. That's all it's saying, right? If I'm going right, there's only one way to reach that because I cannot go up and come down because that's not allowed, right? So I can only go to the right. Now I've computed the bottom row. Now I can look at this value, right? So what is this value? This value is the value from the left, which it doesn't exist, plus the value from below. So this value is going to be one. Similarly, what is the value here? It's a value from the left the value from below. So this value is going to be 2. Here it's 2 plus 1, this is going to be 3. Why is this 3? Well, you can think about why it is 3, right? I can come like this, or I can go right and turn there, or I can go all the way right and come up. So that's why there are three ways of reaching there, right? So similarly, this is going to be 4, this is going to be 5, this is going to be 6. So once I've computed the bottom row, I have enough information to compute the next row from left to right, right? So I can now say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Now the same way, I can say this is 1, this is 3, this is 5, and so on. So I can compute this row also as 1, 3, so not, yeah, so, so 1, 3, 6, 10, 15, and 21, right? So I keep doing this until I hit my row with the holes. So when I hit the row with the holes, I will have 1 here, I will have 5 here, right? But here I will not get 15 because it is a hole. And if there is a hole, then the answer is always 0. Similarly, here I will not get whatever I get for this value plus this, I will just get a hole. Right? So this is what I get in this row. So I, I pre-compute these two as 0. Then inductively, I get this 5 by combining 1 and 4. But this 0 is just, a, a, I mean, it's a fact. I mean, I cannot help it. But now when I come here, I combine 0 plus 20 and I get 20. Again, this 0 is given to me. And again, when I come here, I get this 56 by combining the 0 and 56. Right? So the grid holes just get arbitrarily fixed to 0 because I have just declared that you cannot pass through there. So there cannot be any paths reaching there. But once you fix that 0, then everything else gets fixed along with it. Right? So now I can continue, right? So I can compute the next row. So again, now this is saying that the only way to reach here is from the left because I can't come from below, right? So it's 6 plus 0. Similarly, the only way to reach here is to come from the left because I can't come from below. So it's on 26 plus 0. So I keep doing this and eventually if I walk all the way up row by row, I find out that there are actually with these two holes, remember with the one hole we had computed by combinatorially, we had computed some 1743 or something like that. Now we have fewer obviously because two holes are there, but the number of paths is exactly 1358. So this was done row by row. Now there's anything which respects the topological order is fine. So you can also do it differently. So you can do it column by column, right? So you can start here and you can say, okay, I know this value because it comes from the left and below, and I know the below value, but I don't know the value on the left. So I can fill up this entire column as once. In some sense, we are just saying that there's only one way to walk up this. And now symmetric to what we did before, I can fill up the second column, right? And then when I come to the third column, again, I will put zeros. And obviously, since they are going to give us the same answer, all the other entries are going to be the same. It's just that I'm filling up the entries now this way. But even this is not the only way, right? So let me look at this. 
Now, which values can I at this point, which values can I solve? I can solve this value and I can solve this value also, right? Because we could do it row by row and column by column. So, what if I solve both these values? Okay. Now, which values can I solve? Obviously, I can solve this one and I can solve this one, but I can also solve this one because it has both the incoming values. So, I can actually do it in this order diagonally. So, I can fill up now 1, 2, 1, then I can fill up 1, 3, 3, 1 and so on and get the same thing. Right? So, there are many different ways in which dynamic programming can fill up this grid of uh, the sub problems. Right? Any order which is compatible with the sub problem DAG, the dependencies is fine. So, normally we choose a simple order, it is kind of easier to say if you know like if you are doing row by row or column by column, it is just a simple nested loop, right? for every row, for every column do something. If it is this diagonal order, you have to be a little more careful to enumerate all the elements in the diagonal. So, one way of thinking of the diagonal is all values where the sum is the same. right? So, this is for example, this is 0, 0,3, this is 1, 0,2, this is 2, 1 and this is 3, 0. So, so basically along the diagonal all the entries are actually of the have the same sum i comma i plus j is the same that's how you identify things on the diagonal so that's how dynamic programming works on this particular problem of grid paths okay now one other question that we might ask is is there a difference between dynamic programming programming and memoization right so let's look at this particular situation so supposing i have a scenario where my blocked intersections actually form this kind of a barrier right so there's a barrier right inside the boundary so the only way to go from uh, the bottom to the top if i go inside this i get stuck because there's no way to move right or out up and get out of this so i have to stay along the left border and go this way so there is one path going that way and there is one path going this way right so intuitively you can see that there are only two ways to reach now because i am forced to go either along the left column and then go right or I am forced to go along the bottom row and then go up. Right? So, if I did dynamic programming, what would you do? You would start from here and you would compute all these values and then you will hit these zeros. Right? After a lot of calculation, you will hit zeros and then you will replace the sums with the zeros. But if I do memoization, I will start from here. Right? And this memoization will say, okay, give me this value and this value. And then this value will say, give me that value and this is zero. So, there is no recursive call. So, memoization will only compute values along the boundary. Right? It will only explore these problems because those are the only values which will arise as recursive calls. The other values will return automatically saying it is zero. So, memoization will never explore this entire shaded region is never going to be called recursively if you start and do not call unnecessary things. So, therefore, in this particular case, the number of entries you actually compute is going to be proportional to m plus n because I left these all the boundaries. So, I will have 2 m plus n maybe. So, maybe this more accurately this should be order m plus n, right. Whereas, if I do dynamic programming, I am going to actually fill up m times n, right. This is the size of the table. So, that way dynamic programming does not really care about whether a sub problem is going to be used or not. It just computes it and goes ahead. Whereas, memoization will only evaluate those problems which actually arise in the computation. Now, usually there is not much of a difference, but here you can see there is a kind of quadratic difference, right? It is a linear thing for memoization and it is a quadratic thing for the dynamic programming. So, but even in this such a case, even though there is a potential wastefulness of doing dynamic programming, the problem with memoization is that the only way to use memoization is combining with the recursive solution. So, dynamic programming does two things. One is it exploits the inductive DAG structure to decide the order, but then after that it eliminates all recursive calls. Right? So, the entire table can be filled up just as a nested loop. So, that saving actually overrides this cost of having extra entries. So, usually you will find that dynamic programming even with some wasteful computations like in this case will still perform better than memoization because the space saving is not is more than compensated of by the cost of recursion. So, dynamic programming does not incur that cost. So, the calling and re returning from a recursive function makes memoization more expensive, but there could be situations where the number of sub problems is really huge and you cannot anticipate which all you need to fill up in which case memoization is a better strategy.